right in there. That's, that's what it's all about. And I go, you know, wouldn't it be great if it were that simple? And then I started thinking about it a little bit, and I go, well, I mean, there's more to it than that, but essentially what this guy's seeing in the picture is in a bull market, in an upward market, you want to look for buying opportunities. In a bear market, where the bear market's moving down, you only want to look for selling opportunities. That's a big part of trading, right there. So if you can assimilate that and know that in the direction of the trend is the direction that you want to be trading, you've got a big, uh, you know, um, big burden off your back at that point, because that's one of the biggest critical parts of trading, and that's what we're going to be going into in chart reading here. Our objectives in this session is going to be to learn how to determine the trend of a currency pair, learn how to time our entries into the direction of that particular trend, and the benefit from this is you don't need to predict. Just follow. Follow what the charts are telling you to do. It's kind of like, I don't know, almost like a GPS system on a car. I've gotten very bad at directions lately, you know, because everybody either in your car or on your phone or whatever, you've got a GPS system, and I don't pay attention. I just, you know, she tells me what direction to turn and how far to go, and I'm off to the races. I just listen to her. I don't try to anticipate or predict anything, and it's the same thing in trading here. No need to predict. Just follow what the charts are telling you to do. A lot of newer traders, they try to get into the predicting game. Well, I think the euro is going to be at such and such next Wednesday, or gold three months from now is going to be there. You know, if you like to do that and you enjoy doing it, that's great. I tried to predict a little bit. I found out I'm not good at it. One of my favorite sayings in trading is predicting is very difficult, especially when it involves the future. <laughs> and, you know, it kind of rang home to me, true, when I heard that. Because you, you just don't know what's going to happen. In our own lives, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow for sure. We've got a pretty good idea, but nobody knows for sure. And if you try to be this guy, no matter how good he is with that crystal ball, there's no way he can tell you where the euro is going to be a year from now, a minute from now. So don't try to predict what will happen. React to what is happening on the charts. I've got a lot of favorite sayings in trading. That's one of mine. Don't try to predict what will happen. React to what is happening. And what is happening is told to us very clearly by the trend. We only want to trade the strongest trends, and that's what I'm going to show you how to identify the strongest trends, and then what to do with them after you've identified them. My associate, Matt Russell, he's got a good saying that I embrace. You know, I've got a little laptop up here, and you know, at home, whatever your computer setup is. Matt says, and I agree with him 100%, you shouldn't be trading a currency pair if you can't step to the, almost the other side of the room from where you have your computer monitor and be able to tell that it's either in an uptrend or a downtrend or it's flat. Okay, from across the room, I think we can all agree that's going down. That's a dollar Swiss daily chart. And keep in mind, some of these charts were made a few weeks ago, so there's going to be changes, obviously, in what's happened. But just using this as an example is going to help us understand how to trade the markets. So this is a downtrend, no question about it. In a downtrend, we only look for selling opportunities. This is an uptrend, and we'll talk about how to identify it more, more specifically than this, obviously. This is the New Zealand US dollar in a daily chart. And again, from across the room, I can tell it's going up from left to right. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. OK, now a pair like this. This is the uh, South African Rand Japanese yen on a daily chart. Now, that's one, for example, we'll get into a little more detail on. But that's a chart that if I see that on a daily chart and I'm looking to trade a pair, I'm just going to uh, go on to the next chart. It's flat. And we'll talk about that a little bit too. So these are the three things that a currency pair can be doing on the daily chart. We want to see a dramatic uptrend, a dramatic downtrend, or if I see flat like this, I'm on looking for another pair. So steps to setting up a chart to determine the trend and time the entry. First thing I do is I open up a daily chart with about one year's worth of trading data. It doesn't have to be right to the day or anything like that, but about a year. I like to see that. And most of the charts that I just showed you were roughly a year of trading data, give or take. And then we add a 200 period simple moving average to the chart. And then add on your favorite technical indicator for when we get to the time that we're going to time our entry into the direction of the trend on that daily chart. OK, pound Swiss. Now, several things here. On this daily chart, 
number one, we can identify it from across the room that it's moving down. But here's the first line of defense or the first filter that I use is that green line, the 200 period moving average. Now, some of you may know how that's made up. Some of you may not. So let me explain. It's a 200 period simple moving average. And this is a daily chart. So the period involved is a day. This line is a 200 period, so it's a 200 day simple moving average. The way that line is arrived at is by, let's say if I put my, and if I can hold this steady enough here, I'll put my little red dot right there on that 200 simple period moving average. Not for any particular reason, that's just where I'm putting the dot. Everything to the left of that line that goes back 200 periods or 200 days is what we would average to arrive at that price right where that dot is. So to determine a 200 period simple moving average, what one would do, it's all done for us in the charts though, but the way that line is arrived at is we just get the closing price on the currency pair over the previous 200 days, add all that up, divide by 200, and I know it's there someplace, there it is, that is where the price would be on that line when we're averaging any of those 200 days. Now the significance of it is when price action is below that 200 period moving average, that means that momentum to the downside is increasing. So additionally, in just by seeing that the chart is moving to the downside, we can also get more confirmation because the 200 period average kind of moving average kind of acts like my line in the sand. It's below that level. And the fact that price action is pulling away from the 200 period moving average, you see how it's increasing its distance from the 200 period moving average as it gets lower? That means that momentum to the downside is increasing. So not only is it moving down, but momentum in that direction is increasing. This is a pair I want to keep an eye on for a trade because of that. So what to look for on a chart to determine the trend. Price action is above the 200 period moving average. The pair is in an uptrend. Below the 200 period moving average, as we have on this chart, it's in a downtrend. Price action has been making higher highs and higher lows. The pair is in an uptrend. If the pair has been making lower highs and lower lows on the charts, the pair is in a downtrend. Let's take a look at that. Okay, here's this uh, dollar Swiss pair. Looks similar to the USD Swissy, but we can see A, it's in a downtrend because we can see from across the room it's moving down. It's below the 200 period moving average and increasing its distance. And if we look at these highs, this high right here, this high is higher than that high. So conversely, this high is lower than that one. This low is lower than that high. This low is lower than that high. So you see how it's kind of stair-stepping to the downside? That's what I mean when I say lower highs and lower lows. So we can see, we can eyeball this chart from across the room. It's moving down. It's below the 200 period moving average. And it's also making lower highs and lower lows, downtrend. What I want to do now is just look at a couple charts here and give you my thoughts on this and see what you, what you think in that regard. Now, here's the Euro US dollar. And based on what we've been talking about, the pair has been making for a while higher highs, higher lows. It's above the 200 period moving average right here. But what gives me pause on this particular chart is on the whole chart, which is why I like you to take a look at about a year's worth of trading data, on the whole chart, the movement is relatively to the upside, but look what's happening here. Lower highs and lower lows. So the overall chart is giving me buying signals, but most recently, going back, well, to May, which isn't that recent anymore, but back to here, it's now starting to make lower highs and lower lows. Anytime I get conflicting signals, that's a chart I step away from. I want to see something that's really clear. Why make it more difficult than it is? And, you know, you, you don't have to. You don't have to make it more difficult than it is. Okay, now here we have the pound U.S. dollar, and we've got a similar situation where we've got price actions above the 200 period moving average, 
And recently, it's been making higher highs and higher lows. It's moved above that 200 period moving average. But here again, we see something similar to what we saw on the euro US dollar, where recently, going back to May, April in this case, we've got lower highs and lower lows. So again, I'm getting conflicting signals on this. Now, I'm a longer term trader. So I'm going to look at maybe this daily chart and these type of signals a little bit differently than maybe somebody like we talked about that uh, is on a 30 minute chart and entering on a you know, signal off a five minute or a one minute. So I'm going to maybe look at this a little bit differently. But from my perspective, when I get conflicting signals, because on this chart and on the Euro USD chart before it, I can make a good argument for price action to move up. I can make a good argument for price action to move down. I can make the argument that it's moving up because it's above the 200 period moving average. And for a period of time there, I can make an argument for it moving to the upside because it's above the 200 period moving average and it has been building out slightly to the upside. So I can make an argument for going long. I can also make an argument for going short because we got lower highs and lower lows. If I got conflicting arguments, I'm off to the next pair to trade under the heading of why make it more difficult for yourself. Here's the Aussie USD, which we'll come back to these, these charts a little bit later. Here we've got a situation too where everything, price action is above, completely above, except for right here, uh, back in August of 2010. Price action is above the 200 period moving average. And relatively speaking, it's been making higher highs. And we went into a period of consolidation in here. And now, right there, it took out the previous high right here. So this of the charts that I'm looking at, the Aussie USD and the dollar Swissy, would be the two most interesting charts to me as far as monitoring for a trade. They're pretty clean to the upside, and they haven't been compromised along the 200 period moving average. Pound yen. Recently, lower highs, lower lows. Price actions below the 200 period moving average. But we can see here there's been you know, a pretty good amount of price activity above that 200 period moving average. This one wouldn't put me off too much, but it's not as clean of a trend, for example, as that is. See, what I want you to do is get a feel for the concept of what a good trend looks like. This trend, for example, looks better than that trend just because it's, it's more methodical. It's uh, moving to the upside in a smoother fashion. I was seeing if there was one with the dollar Swiss there. There's the pound Swissy. Okay, and this particular, this pound Swiss daily chart, that trend is better than that one. And in my opinion, the pound Swiss to the downside is better than that trend too. See the difference? See the smoothness of it? It's smoother. <clears throat> now, after the strongest trending pairs are picked, how do we decide which one to trade? Okay, pound yen, I talked briefly about that one. I said it's in a downtrend of late, lower highs, lower lows, price action below the 200 period moving average. But notice how the 200 period moving average, it's kind of flattened out a little bit. We were in a strong downtrend here, and now it's flattened out a little bit because we've got price trading below, above, below, above, below, and that, that'll make it flatten out a little bit. So this is kind of okay of late, but it's not as good as some of the other ones. This Euro Aussie pair, downtrend, lower highs, lower lows, price below the 200 period moving average. This is okay, but again, we've got some compromises of the 200 period moving average. Okay, dollar Swiss. This is, you know, if the, the old expression about if you look in a dictionary under the definition of downtrend, this is the picture you should see. That, I mean, that's just, it's a thing of beauty <laughs> to look at that downtrend. That's the pair you definitely want to trade. You can see that kind of stair-stepping move to the downside, lower highs, lower lows, moving away from that 200 period moving average, pulling away from it, indicating that bearish momentum, selling opportunities, are gaining in force, if you will, because the momentum is picking up speed to the downside. So of all the charts that we looked at, this would be kind of the, the first draft pick, if you will, to talk about football season or something. This would be my first choice. So this is what you want to do. You want to look at several currency pairs. We offer 56 on the trading station. I'm not saying go through all 56. I monitor probably 
22, 24 pairs on a regular basis. But in my opinion, don't get married to a single pair. Don't, oh, I know some people say, I, I only trade the pound or the dollar yen. You know, and if you feel good about doing that and it's working for you, that's great. But I like to trade the strongest trending pairs. If it happens to be the dollar yen, that's great. If it happens to be the pound yen, that's fine too. If it happens to be the euro Aussie, I'll go for that one. I'm looking for the strongest trends and the strongest trends are gonna give me the greatest likelihood of success. Okay, two components of a solid trading opportunity. We've identified the trend, now how do we go about getting into the trade? After a pullback against the dominant trend has taken place, enter when the trend resumes. Or a break of support and resistance in the direction of the trend. So step one is identify the trend. We talked about how to do that. Now these are two strategies to enter the trade in the direction of that dominant trend. So for example, here's that dollar Swiss pair that we talked about again. Perfect. Reiterating, under that 200 period moving average, pulling away, lower highs, lower lows, great, great opportunity. And this is where we're gonna bring our indicator of choice. My indicator of choice is slow stochastics. I like, primarily I use slow stochastics. I'll use MACD as well. And a lot of times people will say, well, what's the best indicator to use? And the best indicator to use, and I mean, it, it sounds almost evasive, but it's, it's very true. It's the indicator that you understand the best, the one that you like the best. Because all these oscillators, slow stochastic, CCI, MACD, they're all oscillators and there's others out there. They're all measuring the same thing, price action. What happens down here is caused by what's going on up here. So, Whichever one of these kind of speaks to you, that's the one you use. Try six or eight different indicators, not all at the same time, and whichever one over a period of time makes the most sense to you, that's the one to use. And what might make the most sense to me might not make the most sense to you. So if somebody says, oh, you're using slow stochastics, you ought to try MACD. Well, try MACD, but then if it doesn't make sense to you, don't use it just because somebody else recommended it. What, what makes sense to you, that's... That's the one you want to use. Now, slow stochastics and oscillators, what they do is they measure kind of momentum. Up, bullish momentum, momentum to the upside. Bearish momentum, momentum to the downside. So slow stochastics in this case is comprised of two lines, the K line and the D line. They're both moving averages. The K line, the green one on this chart, is the faster of the two moving averages. You can see it leads and the other one follows. Now, when slow stochastics has been below 20, the lower line is 20, the upper line is 80. When slow stochastics has been below 20 and then pokes its head up above 20, and even better yet, if it closes above 20, that shows bullish momentum is in favor. Okay, but this pair is in a downtrend. So we only wanna look for selling opportunities. So I'm gonna ignore all signals that this indicator gives me to buy that particular currency pair, because I only want to trade in the direction of the trend, because those are going to be my higher probability trades. So when slow stochastics has been above 80, and then the two moving averages, the K and the D line, cross over each other and come below 80, that shows me bearish momentum is in place. And bearish momentum, when bearish momentum is favored, that's when I want to enter in a downtrend. So you can see each of the spots that I've circled here would be short entries on this particular pair. Now, what I did was I just pulled the one out of the middle here, and I kind of elaborated, it blew it up a little bit. So when we get that crossover in a downtrend, and this is a, a blown up example of that dollar Swiss daily chart, so as soon as slow stochastics has been above 80 and then kind of bends over to the downside here, that's my entry, my short entry. I'm gonna sell the pair at that point. And here's an example I would be entering, see this line where the crossover occurred? And I trail it back up here. So I'd be entering at the open of that candle and I just place my stop above the previous high. And I place it there because Price traded up to that level before, and it got stopped there at that point. So chances are really good that if it trades up to that level again, 
it may, no guarantees, it may get stopped again at that level. If it doesn't get stopped and I get taken out of the trade at that level, I'm glad I got taken out of the trade because perhaps sentiment in the market has changed and the pair could continue, price action could continue quite a bit higher. So I would accept getting taken out at a loss rather than letting the pair move higher and higher and higher and say, oh man, I think it's going to turn around. I hope it's going to turn around at some point. Just get me out of the trade. And here's another way we want to, like the other one was wait for the pullback and then enter the trade when it starts to resume back in the direction of the trend. Now in this one, we're doing it a little bit differently. We're waiting for price action to take out a previous level of support in a downtrend. So for example, dollar Swiss, daily chart again. I mean, it's the best example of a downtrend that's out there. Pair trades down, it finds support at this level. And then it starts to move to the upside. It stalls at this level and it comes down and now prints a new low. This was the old low right there. Now it takes out that low and moves to the downside. This would be your entry point using this strategy. This is kind of a breakout type of strategy. It's breaking out below its previous support. And so the entry would be right there. My stop would go in that area. You could also make an argument for a stop there or a stop there. The safest, most conservative, and if I'm, I'm conservative, if nothing else, when it comes to my trading here, my stop is going to go above there. The next entry, see it created a new low right here, it took out that old low, and it created a new low here. It traded down to that level and then backed off, didn't break, didn't take out that low right there, traded back up again, and now it took out the low, the previous low here. So that would be another entry point. If you missed this one, you could get in on that one. Or if you got in on that one, you could add to your position on this one. You could scale in and put it on another you know, one lot or micro lot or whatever your account size might dictate. So it took out the new low, or took out the old low right there, makes a new low right here, trades up, takes out that low right there, that's another entry point. Makes a new low, takes out that low right there, that's another entry point right there, and so forth. So we can either do it this way, getting in at the top of the move as it rolls over to the downside, or same chart, just different method of entry, you could get in as each successive low is taken out in a downtrend. Now the opposite would be true in an uptrend. So I mentioned on that the same principles that we learned for trading on a daily chart will apply to any time frame chart. Because the information on trading on candlestick charts, you're going to do it the same way regardless of the time frame that you're interested in using. So for example, if you're trading off of a four hour chart, you can open up a four hour chart with 40 days of trading data, add a 200 period simple moving average, Sound familiar? Same thing we did on the daily. Use your favorite technical index. Well, look for the strongest trending markets with the, uh, with the uh, four hour chart and then with the 200 period moving average. And then uh, use your favorite technical indicator to time the entry in the direction of the trend, just like we've done on the daily chart. So here, for example, here's a four hour chart on the dollar Swiss. 200 period moving average. Again, because we're dealing with a shorter time frame chart, the price action is going to be a little bit choppier, but still we can see it's in a downtrend. And here's our slow stochastics on a four hour chart. And every time it rolls over after having been above 80, or here it just touched, so I'm fudging a little bit on that one. But every time it's been above 80 and rolls over, close to 80 in this case, that would have been an entry point. Uh, here's a US uh, Swiss heat pair on the daily chart and USD Swissy pair on the four hour chart. And like it says down here, each candle on a daily chart reflects all the trades that took place in that 24 hour period. Because a daily candle is a 24 hour candle and it runs from 5 p.m. Eastern time one day until 5 p.m. Eastern time the next day and it reflects every single trade that took place in that 24 hour period. That's a lot of trades. The four hour chart, each four hour candle reflects every trade that took place in that pair in a four hour period. So one sixth the amount of data is reflected in that four hour candle as you have in the daily candle. So this is why I'm getting to the lady's question over here about the reliability 
of the candles and, and why, why we would want to trade off, let's say, longer term charts. So like I say, the more data that goes into each candle, the more reliable the feedback from the chart will be. And a daily chart will be more reliable in a four hour, a four hour will be more reliable in a one hour, and so forth. A one hour is going to be more reliable in a 15 minute, a 15 minute is going to be more reliable in a five, and so forth, simply because there's more data. Now, I get a lot of questions on that. One of the questions is like, well, so the, so the one hour candle is giving me false information? You know, or the 15 minute candle is giving me erroneous information? No. It's just giving you information based on what it has to go by. Shifting gears a little bit here. Three random pictures, three different people. I picked this gent because he, maybe, maybe he's about 10 years old, and this lady, let's say 20 to 30, and this gent, let's say 50 to 60. Let's say, bear with me on this analogy, let's say that you've got an important decision to make in your life whether it's, you know, should I get married, uh, what, uh, what college should I go to, what college should my kids go to, um, should I change jobs, what job field should I get into, you know, I mean, questions with some import behind them. And let, let's just zero in on one, let's say the question is, should I buy a house? And you know these three people, and you know them to be good people. So you start with the 10-year-old, and you start talking, you know, you, you think I should buy a house? Well, he's probably got some opinions on that. But my guess is he's never bought a house. He's probably lived in a house, but he's never bought one. And he's got 10 years worth of data that he can give you opinions on about whether or not you should buy a house and if that's the house you should buy and, you know, your mortgage payment is going to be this, what should the down payment be? He's not going to, you know, understand a lot of that. But he's going to give you an honest answer based on what he knows as an individual. Now this lady, 20, 30 years old, maybe she's bought a house, maybe she's bought a couple of them, maybe she hasn't bought any, just depends on her life. But she's gonna have more knowledge about buying a house than this gent is. Nobody's lying to you, it's just based on their knowledge. Now maybe this guy in the 50 to 60 range, maybe he's bought and sold several houses you know, over his lifetime. Maybe he knows people in his family that have done it. He's got more knowledge on the subject. Not because he's got, you know, I don't care what his IQ is or anything like that, but he's got more, just experience in the question that you're asking. Think of this guy as the daily chart. Think of the lady as the four-hour chart. Think of the 10-year-old lad as the one-hour chart. Or think of this guy as the one-hour chart. Think of this lady as the 30-minute chart. Think of this guy as the 10-minute chart. But the charts aren't giving you erroneous information. It's just that they have less data to go on. And that's why, in my opinion, the daily chart, I mean, that, that's the crucial one for me. Now, if you would go out, let's say, farther than a daily, go to a weekly or a monthly chart, you're going to get even more data. And those charts are going to be more accurate than the data, or the daily, excuse me. But the problem then is going to be, we're talking about entry signals on a daily chart. If you're just using a monthly chart, you might get two or three trades set up on a monthly chart in a year. Most of us want to be trading a little more than that. If you go down to a weekly chart, similar type of thing. That's why I find the daily it's a long enough expanse of time that it gives you a good feeling about what's going on in the market with that particular pair. And then you can enter off the daily chart if you choose, or you could drill down to a four hour or one hour chart if you choose. But just think of these three people, you know, when you think about the feedback that you're getting from the charts. Quick recap, chart reading 101. Don't predict, react to the situation. Don't be the guy with the crystal ball. A, uh, one funny comment, I thought it was funny anyway, that came in in one of the webinars that I was doing, because every once in a while somebody will ask a question, Richard, where do you, where do you think the euro is going to be in six months? Or, you know, and I say, well, that's a crystal ball question, and everybody generally gets the idea that that's a predicting question, and I don't predict. So one, one guy finally, he asked several crystal ball questions one day, and then the next day he logged into the webinar and he says, I've given up on the crystal ball questions, I'm not using that anymore. He says, magic beans. That's the answer. I'm using magic beans to predict the way the market's going to go. I mean, same thing. But anyway, you get the idea. Don't predict. Only buy in an uptrend, only sell in a downtrend. Use the daily chart with one year's worth of trading data. Add a 200 period simple moving average to the chart. And then add your indicator of choice, your indicator, the one that speaks to you, not the one that I recommend or the one that somebody else recommends. Try them all and decide on the one that you like. It's almost like you know, buying a car. You're going to take a lot of them out for a test drive, and you're going to zero in on the one that fills the bill for you in whatever way it does. 
And then the same thing is going to be true here. The indicator that fills the bill for you is the one that you should zero in on. You don't need you know, four or five different indicators on your chart. They're redundant, pretty much. They're telling you the same thing. Find the one that you like, stick with that one. Your chart will get uncluttered. Life will be easier as far as and, excuse me, interpreting the chart. Um, in an uptrend, price action is making higher highs and higher lows. In a downtrend, price action is making lower highs and lower lows. Uh, price action above the 200 period simple moving average, we're in an uptrend. Price action below the 200 simple period moving average, we're in a downtrend. Pick the pair to trade with the longest and smoothest trading cycle. Remember, the best example up there was that dollar Swiss chart, nice and smooth, stair steps to the downside. The worst example of a trending chart that we had up there was the uh, South African Rand Japanese yen, where it's just flat as a tabletop. I mean, good luck trying to figure out which way that one's going to move. People can trade that, for sure, but not with a trending strategy. Uh, enter a trade after a pullback when price moves back in the direction of the trend, or enter a trade after price breaks through previous support in a downtrend or previous resistance in an uptrend. And then the same chart reading principles will apply to any time frame chart. And remember that the longer the time frame of the chart, the more reliable the feedback will be. Thanks for attending Chart Reading 101. Glad you're here. Thanks.